Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. The important thing to remember on this first Sunday of Lent is that Jesus went into the wilderness filled with the Holy Spirit. He went in from a place of strength and confidence and hope and courage. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he goes into the wilderness and more than that, the Holy Spirit leads him through every experience he has through this period of 40 days. So it's from a place of confidence and trust and strength that he goes in to face all that he will face. And in the scripture, we have an insight into what is going on in his mind. So what do you think this is? I know it's a canvas print, but what do you think this is? What are you looking at? Type of crane? Type of crane? A lifting, oh, that's, that's good, Chris, a lifting device. An old mangle. An old mangle. <laughs> you shouldn't talk about me like that, Paul. He really shouldn't. It could be an old mangle. Something to do with a lock. Something to do with a lock. Uh, it's a photograph I took at uh, Crestbrook Mill in Derbyshire. And this would have been at one stage, you're absolutely right, you would have wound it up and down to let the water in and out of the mill race. Now, I took it when I was really poorly with depression back in 2013. And Sue and I went and had a week in the Peak District. And we were walking on the path at Crestbrook Mill. And there was a, a lovely young couple, um, obviously deeply in love. They were holding hands. <coughs> and they were walking in front of us on the path. And you can just make them out there. And it struck me that they had absolutely no idea, looking at me, what was going on in my head. They would have no idea at all that my mind was like that. The cogs stuck fast together, nothing budging or moving, that I was feeling completely lost within my sense of who I was. They had no idea that this was my truth, that my mind was like this. I said, I mean, is it an image you like or not? Be honest, we're in Lent. No, yeah. Well, maybe, it's a bit avant-garde. <laughs> the reason I say that is that I've said to Mary that um, she can have it and sell it to raise money for the South Africa trip. So if somebody would like it, you might want to make Mary an offer. Uh, but there it is. If you don't want it, then um, we'll give it away. Uh, but that is a bit of testimony to what you can't otherwise see. And we know what that's like. Because each of us here at the beginning of Lent, we're sitting here with things going on in our minds that we wish were different, aren't we? What we find in Luke is we get testimony into an experience that was so profound and central <coughs> for Jesus. Because he's the only source of that, isn't he? He's sharing with us what otherwise we wouldn't see. He's sharing with us what's going on in his mind at this really important moment for him. He's disclosing this testimony. And it comes from that place where he's confident and strong in God. Can we have the first slide, please, Ken? Now, there is a biblical pattern that is really familiar. And you find it in the Old Testament. You find it in the New. You find it in the Psalms. You find it in our own minds and lives and experience. And it's this. You start with orientation. That's when everything is going fine. It's all good, and in the Psalms, you typically would find the psalmist saying, thank you, Lord, everything is hunky-dory. It's really good. Wow, it couldn't be better. And everything is settled, and we're okay. It's all good. And then something happens to completely disorientate us. And we're plunged into a situation, perhaps, that we didn't choose, but we're plunged into something that threatens to overwhelm us, shatter us, break us, pull us apart, threaten us. We are disorientated. 
And then at the end of that experience, what we find is that here in Scripture, we see we re-emerge and we have reorientated ourselves onto the truth that God loves us and nothing can separate us from that. So we start with that. We start with praise. We start with thankfulness. We then plunge into an experience into which we are disorientated and then we emerge because God has held us. We emerge into that place again where we can praise, where we're different, where we're changed. Does that sound familiar? There's some people nodding. It's okay. Good. Next one, if we could, Ken. So the weather's been a bit iffy this last week, hasn't it? And Sue and I were out walking the dogs, uh, and I turned around and I said to her, I said, look, love, we're going to have to walk back home now, or else we're going to get soaked. And this is what we saw. And you can see Sue took it on her phone. Can you see the storm coming up? The black clouds coming, about to envelop us. And yet what you also see is above the storm, there is the blue sky and the sun is shining and it's catching the cloud tops and it's awesome. This is the pattern we're talking about in the Bible. That our sense, our trust, our experience of God's love in Jesus for us, our sense of the presence of the Spirit is something we hold on to when the storms come and threaten to overwhelm us. The truth is that above the clouds, the beauty and the sun, it's there, the love is there, and we reorientate us ourselves once the storm has passed. So the first, next one please, Ken, if we could. So let's have a look at how the Psalms portray this pattern. Here is Psalm 91, and it's a psalm of orientation where we remind ourselves what God is like, how much God loves us, and how much we can trust in God. And remember, Jesus was a rabbi. He was a teacher of the faith. He understood his scriptures. And this is what oriented him when he went into the wilderness to face up to all that could damage or disfigure his ministry and all the things we have to face. Here in this psalm is real trust that the light is shining. Look at it, my shelter. I take refuge in the shelter of the Most High. My mighty fortress, my God, I place all my trust in you. The trust to see us through when we can't see the way ahead. And look at the image, this beautiful, intimate image of God. Let's say it together, shall we? From like a bird protecting its young. So we say, like a bird protecting its young, God will cover you with his feathers, will protect you under his great wings. His faithfulness will form a shield around you, a rock-solid wall to protect you. You'll not dread the terrors that haunt the night or enemy arrows that fly in the day or the plagues that lurk in darkness or the disasters that wreak havoc at noon. <coughs> that fundamental trust which takes Jesus into the wilderness is this trust in the God who is his Father. A really intimate, tender image. Next one, if we could, Ken. And then in Psalm 13, we see what disorientation looks like with that plea that we recognize ourselves. How long? How long? How long? How long must I agonize? Grieving your absence in my heart every day. How long? Which of us hasn't cried the, how long must I endure this? How long is this going to go on? How long must I suffer? How long must I struggle? That utter disorientation as life threatens to overwhelm us and plunge us into despair and struggle. And yet, in the midst of that, there is also that orientation to God whose love is faithful and whose love cannot be taken from us. But I trust in your faithful love. Next one, Ken, if we could. 
and the reorientation at the end of the struggle we can see in Psalm 30. Let's say it together. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. That was Jesus' truth. When he went into the wilderness, that's what was sustaining him. This absolute confidence in the love of God. And what we see in the wilderness experience and the temptations of the devil is nothing less than a prefiguring of Easter itself. We see everything that would bring Jesus down and destroy him overcome. And then as he comes out of the wilderness, powered by the Spirit, as he goes to the cross, as he's risen from death, we see the truth of this trust. That nothing but nothing can separate us from that love which is our eternal home. And so this is Jesus' Bible. This pattern is what sustained him and kept him on the path. Next one, Ken, if we could. And the whole pattern you can see. An orientation at the beginning of Lent for you and for me towards God in whom we trust no matter what we have to face. We recall our own testimony and the testimony of others that God is there with us. You mended the shattered pieces of my life. You gave me another chance. You saved me. Next one, Ken. And then this. When things were quiet and life was easy, I said in arrogance, nothing can shake me. I thought I was as strong as a mountain. Everything is fine. It's great. It's hunky-dory. Wow, isn't life good? And then look what happens. The wheels come off. And we find ourselves in an experience we do not want to have and we are shattered. And it's as though for the psalmist, God has gone away. When I had depression, my faith went. I had no access to God. And it was as though I'd been left. And I crumbled in fear. But then look what happens. I love this. You did it. You did it. You did it. Hallelujah. You did it. You brought me through. Let's say it together. You did it. You turned my deepest pains into joyful dancing. You stripped off my dark clothing and covered me with joyful light. You've restored my honor. My heart is ready to explode, erupt in new songs. It's impossible to keep quiet. Eternal one, my God, my life giver, I will thank you forever. And we know what that's like, don't we? And we know what the disorientation is like. And Jesus faces up to everything in the wilderness that would destroy us and diminish us from the heart of this faith. So the next one, Ken, if you would. So... When the devil comes to Jesus, he's attacking him around three instinctual set of needs that we have as human people. Three things that we crave, three things that we need, and that's where the devil attacks Jesus. And the first of these is our need for power and control. Let's take back control and it will be fine. Nobody can hurt us. We will stand in our Brexit wonderland. <laughs> but that phrase, take back control, is seductive and slippery, isn't it? Who has control? Who has power? Who is in? Who is out? I took that photograph down on Filey Seafront because I wanted to capture the shadow. Because it's a deep, 
dark shadow that this person was casting. And here in the wilderness, the devil is tempting Jesus to cast a long shadow of power and control that will hurt and harm other people rather than set them free. The temptation is to take all the power and control to himself for his own benefit, for his own self-aggrandizement. And if Jesus had have done that, what a long shadow that would have cast on history, wouldn't it? But it's not about taking power and control to ourselves, is it? The Bible shows us that we trust in God and in God alone to be our salvation. And so Jesus resists the temptation to take power and control for his own benefit, for his own good. Refuses to do it, but stands in the truth of scripture, his own scriptural tradition. The God alone is the one to whom we give our lives. Next one, Ken. And then there is our need for safety and security. What would the church be like if we always played it safe? No, we won't do that because we'll upset so-and-so. Oh, we can't do this because so-and-so might not like it. We can't do that. We can't do this. What would it be like if we always played it safe and never took a risk? We wouldn't get anywhere. What would it have been like if Jesus had have played it safe and not gone into the wilderness? How on earth would he have faced up to the cross? What would it have been like if John Wesley had have said, no, thank you, Holy Spirit, I don't want my heart strangely warmed. I'm quite okay, thank you, being an ineffective Anglican priest. Leave me where I am, do not rock the boat. <coughs> what would it be like if at every turn we just thought about keeping safe and secure and not rocking the boat? And the devil said, whoa, Keep it safe, keep it secure, look after yourself, Jesus. Forget about the others. Come on, put yourself first. Be safe and secure. <coughs> but he has nothing to do with it. And he strides out and he faces up to Good Friday and he overcomes all the violence and hatred and evil and wickedness that the devil can throw at us and at life. He does not keep himself safe and secure. He faces up to it precisely because he is safe and secure in God's love, which can't be taken away from him. And the next one, Ken. And then the devil has a go at our need for affection and esteem. I took this photograph. Uh, at Princess Avenue Methodist Church at Open Doors, the Asylum Seeker and Refugee Project. And these are two young women from Europe uh, who are part of the community there. How do you think they are? What do you see? What do you notice? Good friendship. Good friendship. How do you know? Very close together with the body language holding the other's legs there, they're smiling. You can tell they are close. They are loved, they are cherished, they are safe. And when you think about how at risk and vulnerable they would otherwise be, here they are seen as the beautiful human beings that they are. Here they are valued for who they are. Here they are not exploited. Here, there is not coercive control and power over them. Here, the church takes risks to keep them safe, that they can live the lives God wants them to live. And what the devil does is try to pervert that love that God has. What the devil is doing here with Jesus is saying, oh, well, if God loves you, God will save you. A setting God up to fail. And in relationships, sometimes that is what happens, isn't it? Well, I don't know. I know. I'll prove that he or she loves me by doing X, Y, or Z. And actually, because I'm unlovable, they're not going to love me, and I'll just prove it to myself. 
or there could be a real abuse. Well, if they love me, they will do whatever I say. And if they don't do it, they don't love me. Affection and esteem. Jesus will not dishonour the relationship he has as God's son. He will not put that love to the test. He will not abuse it. He will not test it or try it because he trusts in it ultimately that God is the God who holds his life and whatever he faces, God will still be there with him to bring him through. And in Gethsemane, before Good Friday, he has that same trust in the love of God who holds him. Next one, Ken, if we could. So there's the pattern. A pattern of praise and trust. We are disorientated and then we reorientate ourselves to God. And that's where Jesus finds himself. Here, this first Sunday of Lent, he goes in fully oriented to God and trusting. And then the devil tries to disorientate him and he has none of it. And he holds strong and true to his face, his experience of God, his father. And he comes out of the wilderness reorientated powerfully. And the first thing is he goes and preaches the kingdom, doesn't he? That's the pattern. And the next one, Ken, if we could. So I want to leave you with this. That's a piece of the Berlin Wall. Uh, it stands or stood outside the Imperial War Museum in London. And I was just really struck by the graffiti on it. Change your life. At the beginning of Lent, we have a choice. We can try and make it all about us. We can give things up and say we've given stuff up. It can be about us, ultimately. We can keep God out. We can be safe behind the wall. We can look at our safety and security and say, mm, I think not. Hmm. Or we can tear the wall down. And we can let God in Lent lead us to the place where our life needs to be changed. The place within our experience where God's love and grace needs to touch us and transform us. We can tear the wall down that separates us from experiencing God's love in its fullness and its power. We can tear the wall down is what Jesus does on Good Friday and Easter Day. We can let God change our lives. So I put it to you, rather than give something up, take something up. Invite God to meet you at the place of your struggle or your despair or your anxiety or your hopes and your dreams. But in Lent, journey with God through that place however disorientating it is, knowing that you will arrive at Easter safe and secure in his power to raise up from death you and me and the whole world. Tear the wall down. Change your life this Lent. And trust in the one who was faced down the worst that we ever have to cope with. And you might want to think about whether you want to put some money towards that for South Africa. Because that is about young people going where they leave the safety, the security, the known, the easy behind and take the risk and experience for themselves the truth of Lent. That God will transform in his name be praised.